Hi, guys. Uh, actually, first, uh, let me just welcome you to this talk. Um, I'm usually not the type of person that does product-ish or product pitch talks, so um, I'll try to make it entertaining and also tell you about um, some of the issues I see, what we're working on, and um, a new tool that's coming to the community uh, that hopefully will make things better. And I'm also trying to gather feedback through this talk. So uh, I hope I'll be able to get some bi-directional output out of this to see what do you want to see in that tool. And as it grows over the beryllium time frame, what are your needs for, uh, for, for, for this uh, specific tool? So let me just start and talk about this navigating, yes? Yeah, why are you guys here? Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and I could probably pinpoint to a variety of things on, on this, uh, uh, David, if you actually want to get involved with the actual projects, um, what I'm going to talk about will be probably something that's going to be useful in order to know what's important, what's not important. And even as a developer tool, the reason why we're actually, and I'll, <laughs> I'll present the tool eventually, but uh, the reason why we think there is a need for a tool is because uh, Open Daylight has been flying blind quite a bit uh, within the projects and, and, uh, and what's there. So, um, and I'm getting to that. So, Open Daylight is an, I'll start like that. Open Daylight's an ecosystem. I, if you came in this room uh, thinking Open Daylight was a controller, uh, actually I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll be telling you that Open Daylight is more of an ecosystem than a controller. It has all the puzzle pieces to assemble a controller out of it to build any type of controllers you can dream uh, for any industry, not only, uh, not only uh, and networking. It's actually well suited and was designed for the networking industry, but I've seen it in industrial uh, automation and even um, uh, we're, we're working on some smart grid projects with ODL. So it actually spawns more than just the network piece of it. What Open Daylight is at its core is a reactive platform. So once you understand that, that Open Daylight is all about components reacting and exchanging together in an asynchronous fashion. Um, it actually dawns on you that what you can build and how you can leverage Open Daylight in a variety of ways you could not even uh, have dreamed of. Um, but with all these projects and like in the past, uh, like uh, through the growth of the projects, you had about 20 projects in the hydrogen release, just, uh, about 40, um, uh, sorry, about uh, 23 in the helium release, and then 43 uh, in this release. You see that we are facing an exponential growth of new projects and new ideas and people with great um, endeavors coming to open daylight. But what is, this is creating is it's creating a bunch of silos, right? So these silos are, uh, are basically due to the fact that each people bringing their project are kind of going at this uh, in order either to build a product, build a solution, or do something very specific with the platform to solve a, specific, uh, an, a business need. So when people are, 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 are building, what you can see from an open daylight in stats here uh, is really that growth in the number of projects and in the, also the number of commits. You saw this morning the actual stats from Neela. This uh, uh, was a little bit before, but the project is growing exponentially and, and tackling areas that we didn't even think about when actually we uh, set foot in, the in, in this endeavor. One of the main uh, issues and or 
good thing with uh, is actually uh, the open daylight architecture. For, for a long time, people were kind of saying, does open daylight have a real architecture or, or not? Um, and it's really when you dig into uh, the relationship between the projects. So because open daylight is model driven and everything is about the models that you have at the core of the platform, the architecture really depends on these models. So it is the relationship between the consumers and producers of different parts of the model that governs that specific architecture. That makes it very um, uh, difficult for people that are less familiar with open daylight to jump in because it's not like just picking up an API and getting started with it. You actually need to understand how the mo all the models interact and how the different projects uh, work together. And the good thing, or uh, at least what we have right now in this release, is a variety of southbound plugins or a variety of southbound uh, components and as well a variety of northbound components. We have list service, we have group based policy, uh, there's uh, PCMM, I mean, you guys can read. There, there's a large uh, number of components, but then people go at this and, and are actually wondering what's what, how does it work, what can I do with all these components. If you're not actually just, if you've been through Open Daylight's documentation and you can throw rocks, I mean, it, we all know that it's a little uh, uh, sketchy, um, but the, the reason why the documentation is so, so sketchy today is that each project documents everything based on their project view. In, in other words, uh, if you go to the, uh, the list project, for, I'll, I'll take that as, as an example, well, you will get the list view, view of the world. And, uh, and so it will be about overlays, it will be about termination, and so right now, that is the reality. These projects are still very siloed and there's, um, uh, and, and right now we only have a controller platform, so it's a control platform. Uh, that is going to get worse as the project matures and spans other areas of uh, SDN and NFV innovation. Open Daylight will most likely not stay only as a single monolithic controller piece. Uh, as part of the ecosystem, we're already seeing, we already have like OpFlex, for example, as a policy agent. There might be other forwarding agents in the future. And so the project will grow to be uh, more than just uh, a Java container. So if you look at today's dependencies, that's another challenging thing, right? I mean, we do these graphs and we actually build uh, these by extracting the dependencies from the, uh, uh, the, the, the repositories, but these are created by hand. In other words, we just extract it and then we curate it. And you see the level of complexity in these dependencies is very challenging to track and maintain from a human perspective. Um, sometimes it's hard to know what's what. Of course, you have the offset system that was introduced in Ilium, which helps uh, understand and manage what projects are a little more important from the other ones. But if you're not familiar or if you're not uh, a day-to-day -day open daylight developer, then you probably won't know what's the difference between an offset zero or what's the difference between an offset one or offset two. An end user coming to open daylight today will have no understanding on what project is important and what project is just probably a mess or a work in progress or just a, a, a research project, right? So it's very uh, difficult to understand and manage these uh, these relationships. We have open daylight, just so you know, you have the uh, offset zero projects, which are really, really the must have or the must understand ones. Um, ODL parent, which actually brings 
Um, and I think, by a show of hands, how many of you would like me to explain a bit about the projects? Uh, or do you know already all of them? OK, so <laughs> I, I will explain to you guys uh, what they do and, and why they exist. Because I, I think that's something that, that brings me to my talk and why uh, we need a better way to do this. But uh, I will go with a bit of an overview and explain to you how you could leverage the potential of these amazing projects. ODL Parent is an amazing project. It does absolutely nothing but is a dependency uh, repository. So it is the root from which uh, you build. In, in other words, it only provides you with um, a way to have uh, a root for the build system so that all the third party dependency versions uh, are specified in the parent so that you don't have too many uh, different versions across the different sub-dependencies. And also, it provides a bunch of templates and utilities to go in and, um, and reuse, like uh, other parents that can be used in the build system. So ODL parent is there only from a convenience standpoint versus being a real functional project. Then you have Yang Tools. The reason, uh, what Yang Tools does as a core is it parses Yang. Um, and Yang Tools is a very, very important project because it is the foundation of the way the different components communicate. So in order to, for the components to communicate together, you actually need to have Yang Tools as part of uh, any dependency or anything you do. Um, there's two, one interesting fact that uh, that you might want to know is that there's two sides to Yang tools. There's a compile time uh, conversion where you take Yang and it will parse the Yang and generate Java out of it, right? Uh, so this is the compile time bindings or the compile time uh, rendering of the, uh, of the Yang. And then there's also some black magic within Yang tools where you have a runtime version of this. So that allows you to actually generate the Java code when you have never seen the device. So this is very useful in a netconf-based environment or a netconf-based connector um, because it will generate the Java classes even if the device was never seen before. So like you mount the device and you will have the internal classes as if you had compiled them. But the, um, uh, this, these two aspects make uh, Yang Tools a very important piece of, uh, of the infrastructure. In the future, uh, also Yang Tools is independent of the language or the binding. So it parses Yang, but it actually doesn't have the Java binding part of it. This is part of the controller project or the MD cell or the model driven service abstraction layer. And these Java bindings is how you actually do that translation between the Yang and, um, and the Java files. In future releases, uh, some members of the community are actually working at extending that to other languages like Scala or any other um, JVM language so that you would have the benefits of going component to component without having the boilerplate that you have to do today. So if you've developed a plugin or if you followed the tutorial, um, I'm guessing you saw that there's a bit slash a lot of boilerplate involved in getting components to communicate. And so the community is working hard at making it that easier and simpler to use. The controller project is the last of the offset zero projects for the lithium release. In beryllium, the next upcoming release, this will be broken in a variety of other um, projects so that it will not be as big. But today, what the controller has, it has the configuration subsystem. The configuration subsystem is, it tells you what components of this are active and what, uh, which ones are, are, are inactive. It, it does the wiring between the components from a Yang perspective. So it's not like the bundles being active within the container or carafe, but it actually 
does um, the messaging wiring between the different components. Um, and you also have the, uh, the carafe or the container work. So basic carafe work is part of controller. And you have the netconf southbound, which is today still part of the controller. That's being broken off. Uh, but because of the um, self-mounting, in other words, the controller mounts itself by default. So because of that, there were some in dependencies within the project that made it harder to split it off. But that's, being, that's been done. So these are really the projects to, um, uh, that are at the core of uh, Open Daylight. And then what you have afterwards is you have OpenFlow Java. So OpenFlow Java is a Java library. It just parses OpenFlow packets. It's not really a real component for Open Daylight. That's, it, it just advertises. Um, the library. Then you have the OpenFlow plugin. What the OpenFlow plugin is, it takes the, it leverages the OpenFlow Java uh, set of libraries and creates a proper plugin. And I've, it has a bunch of uh, basic services for OpenFlow-based networks like LLDP or the device discovery and things that are um, are specific to uh, an OpenFlow-based network. So, uh, if you guys have been following development in other SDN controller work. Um, uh, if I was to compare like to Onos or something like that, what Onos would look like is, uh, is basically the stack where you have OpenFlow plugin, OpenFlow Java together. So that is really um, what a typical SDN controller uh, is. And of course it has intent and other features on top, uh, very great features, but um, the Typical SDN controller bits uh, and the size is approximately the same from code lines and, and, and so on. So the OpenFlow plugin is, is pretty much an o the OpenFlow controller or the SDN controller part of it. Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, honestly, that is a mistake of history, okay? Uh, the reason why they're split is in case something else would want to use it as a library, uh, which never really happened. So it's, uh, in my opinion, it should just be merged in, but uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, there yes? Um, well, the intent system is not yet in, in OpenFlow plugin. The intent system right now sits either on NIC and GUBase policy. So GBP and NIC at the very top layer are the intent system or the intent candidates for uh, for Open Daylight today. NIC provides you with a grammar. In other words, it follows uh, some of the early ONF drafts on. Uh, having a grammar to express your intent, where you have subject, verb, predicate type of uh, structure with conditions and, and constraints and, and so on. Whereas group-based policy is more about contracts between endpoint groups. So you have group of endpoints, another group of endpoints, and how they actually, uh, uh, what type of contracts you can establish between these sets of application. And so um, that, makes it very suitable, and, and I've always uh, felt that group-based policy and NIC are more complementary, where group-based policy is um, awesome in data center environments or where you have VMs or within a cloud. Uh, NIC has been designed to be more of a generic intent that can apply to anything, whether it's a transport network or, or anything else. So it's, it, it yes? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Network intent composition. So uh, yes, I, 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 will, um, <laughs> I, I will provide that uh, uh, a little more uh, there. And uh, seeing Raphael just uh, reminded me that there's also 
uh, work on conflict resolution within NIC and uh, rendering some of the stuff uh, directly within uh, the NIC project. So th that's the, the beauty and the difficulty of Open Daylight is the breadth of these projects for different use case. Another one I'll, I'll, uh, I will take as an example is the VTN, Virtual Tenant Network Project. Um, uh, the OVSDB, uh, which is somewhere that also uh, right below, and then um, the, uh, the group-based policy again. If you are operating an OpenStack integration, these are three ways that today you can integrate with OpenStack. So um, each of these ways have uh, their own strengths and uh, like they've been designed for a specific purpose. Group-based policy allows you to apply policy as I mentioned. VTN was for more, uh, think of it, I, I, I don't wanna, um, but it's more for a campus network scenario. It can be used elsewhere, but it was really, think of it as a multi-tenant campus network style environment where you have open flow switches. So it was designed for an open flow underlay, whereas group-based policy was more edge controlled. So it applies all the policies at the edge where VTN applies it in the core of your network. And finally, the um, uh, OVSDB network part also is one that uses tunnels and uh, edge policy for network virtualization. So these three things are doing the same thing in very different environments and can be leveraged in, in these environments for a different purpose. PCMM, a fantastic project to work with cable modems and have the ability to apply policies and eventually apply uh, cross behaviors, cross gates, uh, QS uh, gates uh, across your cable networks. Um, TTP, table type patterns, extensions to open flow to uh, understand uh, and, and view the uh, table type patterns of your tables, like what, what is that table for, so have the description of them. Uh, topology processing is a tool to allow you to uh, m do some operations on topology, pathfinding, some tools around that. Uh, TSDR is time, s uh, time series data registry or repository, database repository or data repository. Time series data repository most probably. Um, but it is a time series um, uh, project that allows you to store time series from metrics and measurements that you gather, either within your network or outside your network. We've been using, we've been migrating that to get like carbon metrics out of clouds or even other things in OpenStack environments where Celometer doesn't work well if you, I, I know it's not an OpenStack conference, but where uh, the metrics from OpenStack, uh, some or the components for metrics uh, are, are somewhat uh, not able to handle the same load. Uh, well, the TSDR can actually handle a very large message uh, hit and, and so on because of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, VPN is VPN as a service. Uh, Alto is a traffic um, engineering uh, project. Um, uh, LACP is, of course, link aggregation, so the support of link aggregation. Um, IOTDM is for Internet of Things. Uh, uh, USC is a unified secure channel, allows you to bootstrap in a secure way with your devices. Um, and uh, uh, DDIM is a device identification and discovery, which allows you to discover projects that are uh, switches in your, in your environment that uh, did not, that are like legacy. So if they're SNMP switches, um, CapWAP is for a wireless access point, and uh, OpFlex is one of the agents. So technically, OpFlex here doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't depend on controller. It's kind of sitting outside. Um, VTN has some outside component as well, and, and so on. Um, so I think I've covered most of them. Uh, um, yeah. So. Uh, so these are, are pretty much the, the projects. But when you go to Open Daylight, uh, what you'll find is 
you kind of get lost, right? You, you see this very nice picture and then just a list, right? What, what do you do with a list? It's, it's kind of, uh, are all these projects equal? Are, are all they good? Can I all use them? Or is it just stuff that people are working on and it doesn't have a meaningful feature set? Um, I find that, yes? Oh, I'm getting to that. But, <laughs> but uh, today, uh, the, we actually uh, I've been parsing some of the palm files uh, through either external scripts. Uh, we did a palm file crawler as well. I'll, I'll talk about that. And that's going to be part of the tool that we're building and that uh, um, we are trying to launch today. And it's a little issues. But um, <laughs> it is likely going to be up uh, uh, today or tomorrow. So. Um, but I find uh, that when you go to Open Daylight, it's a little bit like booking a room on Hotwire. You don't know what you're going to get. I, it's actually, you get it, uh, you get the component, but it might have bed bugs or, or bugs. So um, it is uh, some of the, uh, yes? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right now, that's being done via script. Well, <laughs> Jamo probably is is better than me on on on, on explaining this. But uh, right now, the way we release is we build the whole thing and we just rename the artifacts. I mean, is that still the case? It is. Okay. Uh, last time it was like that, so I haven't been in the integration work. Uh, or in the integration group for, uh, for a bit. But uh, last time we did uh, the release, it was, it does a huge Maven build. Um, and then afterwards, from these snapshot artifact, there is a script that goes in and renames uh, to the auto-release uh, script. That's how we call it. And um, it renames the artifact based on the release that you are doing. I'm sorry? You're actually, uh, the, yeah, it, it is, uh, it isn't, what it does is it kind of checks it in and then renames the artifacts and then builds the whole thing. So it builds the world and then checks it in. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of our, the method we do it today. I probably shouldn't talk too much about it tutorials here. Uh, but I, I think having a more progressive, or let's call it gated or pipeline way of doing things is really where I, I've been advocating. And a lot of other people have also been advocating some of that. Um, we have a little bit of quality information uh, through sonar. So we do get a bit of how much coverage do we have. But coverage doesn't mean quality. In other words, I can write one Java class that does absolutely nothing but is covered 100%. Um, and we have a bit of that in ODL. Um, so in other words, there is no way today to know about a feature quality or like how much, how good is a specific feature. We've been pushing and pushing features. We through the S3P and in Lithium, we work very hard to increase the quality but, uh, and increase testing and increase coverage. And we're making great progress, but there's no way to know if the feature works or, or how it works. Well, I, through integration tests, we know if the feature works. But do we know if, um, uh, if it meets the end user's expectation is yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in fact, that's 
uh, that's a good point. And most projects in this release have been greatly increased. It, it was like a red map before, and now it's actually uh, getting better and better. So the projects, yes? Yeah, so, yeah, uh, for, for the false warnings, um, are you talking about the sonar CLM thing? Okay, um, if you're referring to some of the uh, built-in gates or like the CLM, for example, uh, or the uh, a couple of other tests or, or things. Um, I think the answer is right now it's a little bit difficult, but I'm sure there will be a way to kind of avoid. Yes, David? Turn it off. Yeah, I, I'm on the same page as you on this. I, I usually don't turn them off. I, I just leave them as is. But uh, um, I don't know what's the best practice within the community. It's has I don't know if it's been discussed or has it been. Um, Right. Yeah, well, I, I don't think people are tr trying to keep it at zero. They, I think they're more trying to keep it at a relative improvement. So it, it's always about being better than yourself. Think of it as a game of golf, right? So you're trying to get a better score, but you're not necessarily trying to, uh, well, you're always trying to get a hole in one, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's really about improving yourself at every time that you build your project or you bring in. Um, another tool that we have within the community is Spectrometer, which is half working or half not working or totally broken. Um, and so that's another important tool, like knowing uh, the activity or the analytics. I, one of the thing it is it, it's important to know as a reference or, or knowing a bit what's happening within the community, who's working on what and, and so on. Um, but you don't want that to become vanity metrics, right? So you don't want to just look at it and say, oh, yes, I, I, we, we get so many uh, X. And so there's so much more than just commits to the community. Um, and just getting cheap commits is not necessarily the best way either, but it is an important indicator, and it is part of knowing the project's overall uh, information. So we are working at either fixing a lot, uh, spectrometer or just, just bringing the same set of metrics to the tool I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, so what we are working and what we've been working for about, yes, Yeah, no, it's broken. It's been stale, yeah. So no, it, it's not up to date. It's not the right stats. And it also, I think it takes all the releases. So it, it's like the, all the commits over time, over the, the past, uh, um, like it, it, it kind of stops before lithium and it's, it's broken. Um, but, and, and that's really the reason why I wanted to have this talk with you guys uh, and talk about uh, navigating ODL 
we are working hard on this tool and we need feedback. We need community input on what you would like to see out of that tool. Um, I will, we are, where at least right now, what we have from a functionality perspective is the ability to browse the projects, have the projects categories, uh, see what Yang files come from what projects, so search uh, the models across the different projects, um, see the dependencies of the projects automatically, so it actually crawls all the POM files, the dependencies, and, and looks at what's dependent on what. So that, that's what we have um, today, but we are adding integration into Sonar and integration into the metrics. The question is, do we have, do we make solometer work, uh, so not solometer, spectrometer work, or um, do we just integrate that as part of graphs of the tool? Uh, so depending on how we actually maintain that going forward, uh, we will be working on that, and we will integrate the ODL forge, or the ODL project forge, around uh, some of that to make it easy to create a project. You click new project, you'll be able to have a new project. So it, it is going to be uh, working with, uh, well, from a forge perspective uh, with automation. And then you'll just graduate your project as it gets approved by the TSC within our life cycles. So this is the tool uh, that will evolve over the, the next couple of months. Uh, we're launching it uh, this week as a, like, first preview of it, and we're really looking at feedback for improvements or ideas on how to make this better. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. So it's, no, we won't close it. <laughs> we're pure play ODL, so. <laughs> so, and, but, yes? Go ahead. Yep. It, it does more than just the SCM stats. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, well, right now it's it's the commits, but it, it's the message on the mailing list, it's the reviews on Garrett and stuff like, so it's it's not only like the commits part, it's it's a bunch of stats uh, trying to get extracts the, these. If we can get some of the info from Sonar, we already did the binding for it, so it, it's actually easier to get it from Sonar. Uh, or the other option is to get get spectrometer running and then just integrate it again uh, within the uh, Explorer tool. So that that was my initial plan. It has a nice API, but a spectrometer is broken half the time, so I, it's kind of making me wonder: should we fix it or or do it again? You're, uh, <laughs> you're stealing my show. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, what we're trying to get to is a rubber stamp approach. And what we want to make it, or what we want to make of it, is community rubber stamps. In other words, you could have an InnoCybe rubber stamp on it, saying InnoCybe thinks that's good, you can use it. HP's rubber stamp, or other members of the community can rubber stamp a component that they've used in their customer engagement and that they like. And of course, you also will get the um, uh, end user's approval. So the end user feedback through ratings will hopefully also help drive uh, some of that. In other words, it's, it's kind of taking the TSC into, like uh, the technical steering committee of Open Daylight, into a, a, a less politic world where it's the end users that vote um, and, and they'll give information about it. Uh, it will not be, at some point, maybe the TSC will put a special star, TSC uh, approved or TSC lifecycle uh, to it. Um, but in, in, in the beginning, uh, it will be more community uh, feedback and focus versus process. Um, so, oops. So yeah, so a bit about us is like what we do, what we've been doing, in case you don't know us, uh, we help people uh, build Open Daylight or leverage Open Daylight in a variety of use cases. Uh, we're pure play ODL and we help uh, test gated pipelines for specific use cases 
uh, and do continuous deployment. So we allow people to add like their secret sauce to it. So that's why these, this tool is uh, important in order to, for people to know what components they want to add and what they want to do. Uh, they have to have that, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's a good question. If you're checking a test case, you don't know if, uh, I'll just repeat, uh, when you check in a test case, you don't know if it's already enabled or not. In other words, does the test case already exist? Um, are you guys still using Testopia as the reference? No, okay. Um, is there a repository of the test cases? System does, I'm guessing. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to uh, talk with you guys today. I, I, I'm really hoping, I mean, I don't know if people want to get feedback on what they would like to see, because now's the time to kind of shape it up, because this tool is going to evolve over the next cycle, over the Beryllium. Uh, it's not part of the Design Summit, just because it's not like an open daylight project yet, but it's kind of on the side. Um, however, eventually, it, it might be part of the infra, and uh, we'd love to get more feedback uh, on what you want to see. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can definitely do that. Um, any other suggestions? Uh, first of all, do you guys think it's uh, an important tool? I'm saying yes. Absolutely. Right. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I think there's two things. Uh, one of them is, uh, and, and we, we will probably would have to talk, but uh, within the OpenFlow plugin, there needs to be a level of conflict resolution even at that level. Uh, just like basic, uh, don't step on my toes uh, type of knowledge on who pushed what, on how. Uh, a little more info there. Plus, uh, that, so hopefully that's gonna make it in, in the redesign, but if not, it's gonna eventually happen. Uh, intent is another a very important way to, to actually uh, move that forward with an intent-based interface. It actually, it actually allows you to know a bit about the intention or like what's the context be behind the request so that if you have a REST call or a REST-based application, then it's easier to understand um, what it is. And, and that's like even from a runtime perspective or what we've been doing with the Boulder project, um, that can sit either on top as an embedded script engine or outside uh, and so on. So it and leverages NIC and, and, and so on. So I like my opinion on this is that um, uh, you're, you're right. People uh, here, 
I mean, <laughs> what, uh, what you were saying is exactly our business model and what we do. Um, but the ODL Project Explorer itself is, is mainly just to kind of guide you through the process, through the life cycle, through the TSC logistics. Like the, what the, the TSC, uh, the release plan is what, uh, 23 pages? Um, so really try to automate this administrivia so that it becomes a lot easier for people to work within the community, to understand the different projects. Also, how like the project descriptions, they're all over the place. Have a minute. Right now we've been pushing for the tool to work overly meta files to the projects, component descriptions, what are the UI features, like what like meta information that describes the project and what it does and how it works. And so we wanna standardize and, and really bring that approach as a best practice for the community. So when you bring a project, you actually um, have a lot more information about your project that's uh, pushed uh, to, the, um, to the infrastructure. So that's, uh, that, that's the reason for the tool. And uh, hopefully you guys will, um, will like it and will have the ability to provide feedback day one on it. So thank you very much for coming to the talk. And uh, feel free to ask me any questions uh, after, the, after the talk. Thank you. <laughs> is actually uh, the open daylight architecture. For, for a long time, people were kind of saying, does open daylight have a real architecture or, or not? Um, and it's really when you dig into uh, the relationship between the projects. So because Open Daylight is model driven and everything is about the models that you have at the core of the platform, the architecture really depends on these models. So it is the relationship between the consumers and producers of different parts of the model that governs that specific architecture. That makes it very, um, uh, difficult for people that are less familiar with Open Daylight to jump in because it's not like just picking up an API and getting started with it. You actually need to understand how the mo all the models interact and how the different projects uh, work together. And the good thing, or uh, at least what we have right now in this release, is a variety of southbound plugins or a variety of southbound uh, components and as well a variety of northbound components. We have list service, we have group based policy, uh, there's uh, PCMM. I mean, you guys can read, there, there's a large uh, number of components, but then people go at this and, and are actually wondering what's what, how does it last, uh, like, uh, through the growth of the projects, you had about 20 projects in the hydrogen release, uh, about 40, um, uh, sorry, about thir uh, 23 in the helium release, and then 43 in this release. You see that we are facing an exponential growth of new projects and new ideas and people with great um, endeavors coming to open daylight. But what is, this is creating is it's creating a bunch of silos, right? So these silos are, uh, are basically due to the fact that each people bringing their project are kind of going at this uh, in order either to build a product, build a solution, or do something very specific with the platform to solve a, specific, uh, an, a business need. So when people are, 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 are building, what you can see from an open daylight in stats here uh, is really that growth in the number of projects and in the, also the number of commits. You saw this morning the actual stats from Neela. This uh, uh, was a little bit before, but the project is growing exponentially and, and tackling areas that we didn't even think about when actually we uh, set foot in, the in, in this endeavor. One of the main uh, issues and or good thing with uh, work, what can I do with all these components? If you're not 
actually just, if you've been through Open Daylight's documentation and you can throw rocks, I mean, it's, we all know that it's a little uh, uh, sketchy, um, but the, the reason why the documentation is so, so sketchy today is that each project document everything based on their project view. In, in other words, uh, if you go to the, uh, the list project, for, I'll, I'll take that as, as an example, well, you will get the list view, view of the world. And, uh, and so it will be about overlays, it will be about termination. And so right now, that is the reality. These projects are still very siloed and there's, um, uh, and, and right now we only have a controller platform, so it's a control platform. Uh, that is going to get worse as the project matures and spans other areas of uh, SDN and NFV innovation. Open Daylight will most likely not stay only as a single monolithic controller piece. Uh, as part of the ecosystem, we're already seeing, we already have like Opflex, for example, as a policy agent. There might be other forwarding agents in the future. And so the project will grow to be uh, more than just uh, a Java container. So if you look at today, hi guys. Uh, actually first, uh, let me just welcome you to this talk. Um, I'm usually not the type of person that does product-ish or product pitch talks. So um, I'll try to make it entertaining and also tell you about um, some of the issues I see, what we're working on, and um, a new tool that's coming to the community uh, that hopefully will make things better. And I'm also trying to gather feedback through this talk. So uh, I hope I'll be able to get some bi-directional output out of this to see what do you want to see in that tool? And as it grows over the beryllium time frame, what are your needs for, uh, for, for, for this uh, specific tool? So let me just start and talk about this navigating. Yes? Yeah, why are you guys here? OK. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, and I could probably pinpoint to a variety of things on, on this. Uh, uh, David, if you actually want to get involved with the actual projects, um, what I'm going to talk about will be probably something that's going to be useful in order to know what's important, what's not important. And even as a developer tool, the reason why we're actually and I'll, <laughs> I'll present the tool eventually. But uh, the reason why we think there is a need for a tool is because uh, Open Daylight has been flying blind quite a bit uh, within the projects and, and, uh, and what's there. So, um, and I'm getting to that. So Open Daylight is an, I'll start like that. Open Daylight's an ecosystem. If you came in this room uh, thinking Open Daylight was a controller, uh, Actually, I'll, uh, I'll be telling you that Open Daylight is more of an ecosystem than a controller. It has all the puzzle pieces to assemble a controller out of it to build any type of controllers you can dream uh, for any industry, not only, uh, not only uh, uh, networking. It's actually well suited and was designed for the networking industry, but I've seen it in industrial uh, automation and even um, uh, we're, we're working on some smart grid projects with ODL. So it actually spawns more than just the network piece of it. What Open Daylight is at its core is a reactive platform. So once you understand that, that Open Daylight is all about components reacting and exchanging together in an asynchronous fashion, um, it actually dawns on you that what you can build and how you can leverage open daylight in a variety of ways you could not even uh, have dreamed of. Um, but with all these projects, and like in the past,